Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. We thank God uh, for each of you and the fact that you're here. We do have some guests uh, today with us. Let's just go ahead and give them a clear creek welcome. We're grateful that you all have made the trip to come and, and to be here to worship with us uh, today. 
We do have as our preacher this week uh, for our service today, tomorrow and Thursday, our campus revival, Dr. David Allen. Uh, He began his preaching ministry. God uh, called him, or at least he answered the call of God at 16 years of age. And uh, today he serves as a distinguished professor of practical theology and dean of the Adrian Rogers Center for Biblical Preaching at Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. He also has a personal ministry that uh, he does, uh, Preaching Coach, and so you can look that up online. has a podcast that goes with that and a personal uh, uh, blog site as well. And so uh, he's been here before. Thank you again for coming. We've tried to remember last night. It's been five, six, seven years uh, since he was here and did a lecture series for us. But just a, a great preacher, great man of God, and we're thankful for his friendship to Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. And you're going to be blessed uh, this week as he brings the manna from heaven and delivers it piping hot for us uh, at each of these three services. With that said, let's pray together and we'll worship the Lord. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful for you. We praise you for your Son, our Savior. Well, we thank you that Jesus not only died for our sin according to the scriptures, but that he resurrected from the dead according to the scriptures. And we know that our hope of salvation is in the message of his death and his resurrection. And Father, we look forward to, as believers, the second coming, the fact that Jesus will return and that we will experience victory over the enemy, over death, over hell, over the grave. Father, I pray you lift every burden today. I pray, God, that you would move in our hearts, in our lives. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. As you speak through the man of God, Father, may we be not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, Clear Creek, if you would stand with me as we worship our Savior this morning.
come standing, kneeling, come to the altar where you are. Just pray to our Savior this morning. this morning. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind. turning back no turning back when peace like a river attendeth my way when so
we come. I pray that you come boldly upon this preacher, Lord, for this week of revival, Lord. But God, we know revival doesn't come by us. Lord, it comes by your spirit. Lord, ready our hearts, prepare our minds. Lord, help us have ears to see, (laughs) eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, that your word is true. Lord, I pray as this man comes to speak and proclaim your word, that we would take it to heart, Lord. I thank you for all that you do. I thank you for Clear Creek. I thank you for this time we can come and worship. Lord, and as we exit worshiping through song and worship through your word, Lord, I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You ready for me? All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. What a pleasure it is of mine to be with you today. I have excited about the opportunity that is mine uh, to be on this beautiful campus. I think this may be my fourth time here over the years, and I love coming here because it's one of the most beautiful places on God's earth. No question about that, but what makes it even more special is not just the beauty out there, but you, because whenever I've been here, both uh, the president And faculty, staff, and all of you who are students have made me feel so welcome and so much at home here. Almost thou persuadest me to move to Kentucky, I'll tell you that. (laughs) So uh, I am sick and tired of Dallas, Texas traffic and noise and everything else that I could easily be persuaded to uh, come up this way. Maybe they would let me be an adjunct professor or something here. (laughs) 
I, I, would, I would do that in a heartbeat, but uh, it's a privilege to be with you. I want to thank Dr. Smith for the invitation to be a part of this wonderful meeting for your president, Dr. Goodman, for the invitation to be here. And uh, congratulations, Mr. President, on your appointment here and the wonderful days ahead because of your leadership. Uh, the school is blessed and, and I'm grateful for you and your stance and your commitment to the Lord and His Word and sound theology and this wonderful faculty stands in that same uh, vein and uh, so great to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful place. I see Dr. Eric Mitchell sitting over there. Dr. Mitchell and I were colleagues at another institution days ago, or along the way, years ago, for, for years together. But I am thrilled that he is here with you. I uh, think of all those times. You know, Dr. Mitchell is a very accomplished uh, Old Testament scholar, especially in Hebrew and archaeology. And uh, I remember the times when I was his dean and he would come to me and struggling with a text in Hebrew and I would... Uh, <laughs> And I would tutor him. <laughs> and he is a much better scholar today because of that. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, if you believe that, <laughs> I have got some swampland to sell you. I can tell you that. No, I love Dr. Mitchell and, and grateful that he is here with you uh, and know that wonderful days are ahead uh, for this school. And uh, here we are in what we are calling a revival. But did you know that you cannot schedule revival? You can't plan it. You can plan to have a series of meetings, which is what you have done. But you cannot schedule or bring revival. Only God can do that. And whether or not this is a true revival or not depends first on God. And then it depends on you and how we respond to the Spirit of God and to the Word of God during this time together. So here is the prayer that I want you to begin to pray today and pray regularly throughout these three days of meetings, which we are praying will be genuine revival. Here is the prayer. Lord, do anything in me you need to do in order to do everything through me you want to do. That's our prayer. Lord, do anything in me you need to do in order to do everything through me you want to do. Let me ask you a question. What does God want to do through Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. Would it shock you if I told you I know the answer to that question? Well, I do. Because God wants to do in this wonderful school a whole lot more than he's ever done before. True? Absolutely true. Is there a wonderful legacy here of this school? Absolutely there is. But is God done? Is God through? No, he's not. He has more to do and wants to do more and a whole lot more even than he's ever done before. Well, now we know that the, any limitation of that does not exist with the Father. So if there is any limitation in that, where is the problem? That would be you and me. Lord, do anything in me you need to do in order to do everything through me you want to do. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 this morning. And I want to bring our first message and do an exposition and application of these verses. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through Four. We're only going to focus on verses 1 through 3 because of the time. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we will read today. 
hear the word of the Lord. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe, who is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, so he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. What Shakespeare is to playwrights, the Mississippi to rivers, and Westminster Abbey to cathedrals. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 is to all of the New Testament. From high atop this spiritual Mount Everest, we are able to look out over God's panoramic plan of salvation. And at the heart, at the foundation, and at the apex of it all is Jesus. God has spoken his final word in one who is by his character and nature his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever stopped to think that unless God speaks, unless God reveals himself, we could never know him? Apart from God's revelation, you and I would never be able to know him. Oh, I know, I know. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. Night unto night pours forth knowledge. But you see, apart from God speaking and speaking directly and revealing himself to us, we would never be able to know him merely by his creation. Oh, I know God speaks in history. I know history declares the sovereignty of God, but history cannot explain to you what Jesus was doing on the cross when he died for your sins. I understand your conscience bears witness to the morality of God, and God is a God of morality, and you can know something about God just by virtue of conscience, according to Paul in Romans 1, but conscience unaided by revelation cannot explain to you what Christ did on the cross when he died for your sins. No, creation, history, and conscience is all one gigantic, indecipherable hieroglyph apart from God's Rosetta Stone, Jesus. And that's what the author of Hebrews is saying to us here. God has revealed himself and spoken to us in his son, Jesus. Speech is a vehicle of revelation. Speech is a way of revelation. Read Genesis 1, and what do we read? Ten times, and God said. God is a God who speaks. And when God speaks, he is acting through that speech. And when God speaks in Genesis 1, worlds leap into existence. So speech is a vehicle of revelation. God is a personal God. God is a God who speaks and who has revealed himself to us in the living word, Jesus, and the written word, Scripture. Speech is a vehicle of revelation. Speech is a vehicle of communication. How else do you and I get to know one another apart from the wonderful gift of God called language? Well, it would be tough you know, we might use sign language and that would be one way, but that's much harder to communicate. But when we have the gift of speech and language, we are able to communicate with one another. Speech is a vehicle of communication and God has communicated himself in language. God has communicated himself in the written word, scripture, and God has communicated himself in the living word, the Lord Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then verse 18, and the word Jesus, he exegetes God. 
because the word in the Greek New Testament there is your word from which we get the English word exegesis. Jesus has manifested God. Jesus has exegeted God for us. Speech is a vehicle of communication. But then God's speech in his son Jesus is a vehicle of salvation because it is through Christ, God's Son, who is God's Word, who is God's speech to us, who is the one through whom God has spoken His Word in His Son to us. Speech is a vehicle of salvation. Jesus is the living Word, and He is the one who saves. Jesus is the answer to all of our questions, the solution to all of our problems, the salvation for our souls, the forgiveness of our sins, Jesus. If I were to mention the name Woody Allen, many of you would know who that is, Woody Allen, especially those of you in my generation. You know, Woody Allen is, was an actor and a comedian and then a movie producer. He has a genius IQ, but he claims to be an atheist. Some years ago, Woody Allen in an interview was asked what I thought was a great question. Mr. Allen, I know that you are an atheist, you claim to be an atheist, but I want to ask you a question. If there is a God, and if that God should speak to you, what would you most want to hear him say? Woody Allen thought for a moment, and then he responded, well, if there is a God, and if that God should speak to me, I would most want to hear him say, three words, you are forgiven. Ladies and gentlemen, at the heart and core of every sane human being on this planet, if there is a God, and if that God should speak to them, they would most want to hear him say, you are forgiven. The book of Hebrews, the New Testament, and yea, all of the Bible is God's revelation of his wonderful plan of salvation which brings forgiveness of our sins. That's the heart, really, of Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 we are going to see in just a moment. Now notice how this text begins. Long ago, actually it's interesting in the Greek New Testament, this book begins with two adverbs. It's the only book in the Bible that begins with an adverb. I'll buy you a steak dinner if you can tell me the only book in the New Testament that ends with an adverb. The book of Acts ends with an adverb translated in most English translations, unhindered. Actually, it would be unhinderedly, I guess, as an adverb. The book of Acts ends with an adverb. The book of Hebrews begins with two adverbs. In different ways and in different modes, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets long ago. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. This is a comparison and a contrasting of God's revelation of himself and his word in the Old Testament through the prophets and his revelation in the New Testament through his son, the Lord Jesus, his final revelation. Now, I love the Old Testament prophets, don't you? I love those prophets. I love to read them. I'm in the process now in my personal quiet time of reading through the, the major and minor prophets of the Old Testament. I am now in Hosea. And I love the prophets. It's interesting. They all spoke with different accents. You've got the lofty eloquence of Isaiah. You have the plaintive cry and wail of Jeremiah. You have the schizophrenia of Jonah. You have the country accent of Amos, the country preacher who calls the women in his congregation fat cows of Bashan. Can you imagine? All of those prophets spoke with different accents, but they all spoke the word of God. God spoke through them. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken to us in one who is his son. So the author is, is talking about the continuity of revelation 
in the Old Testament with the New Testament with the prophets and Jesus, it's the same God who's speaking. That's the continuity. But then the contrast is in the Old Testament, you got a prophet kind of a revelation, but now you get a son kind of a revelation. You get revelation through the prophets, which was the word of God and accurate and inerrant and all of that. But now you get God's revelation incarnate. Now you get God's revelation in his living word, one who is in relationship to the father in such a way that God has spoken through the son who by his character and nature is one with the father by virtue of our doctrine of the Trinity. And so God spoke long ago to the fathers, through the prophets, but now he's speaking through his son. The prophets said, thus says the Lord. Jesus says, I say unto you. The prophets lived and they died. Jesus lived, died, but he rose again and lives forever. The prophets spoke the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. There's a world of difference between a prophet kind of a revelation in the Old Testament and the revelation of God incarnate through his son, Jesus. God has spoken, look at it, has spoken to us in these last days by his son. The last days there, that's a technical phrase that is used in Scripture, used in the New Testament, to mean the times after the coming of Jesus, after the coming of the Messiah. Did you know you're living in the last days? We're probably living in the last hours of the last days. The last days were inaugurated when Christ came and when he died on the cross, rose again and ascended to heaven. Now we're in the last days. The Jews in theology divided the ages or the times or the epochs as this age and the age to come, as the, this age and the last days. And that's exactly how Paul and the other New Testament writers are developing that concept. And so now we learn, verse 2, in these last days, God has spoken. Notice God was speaking, participle. God having spoken to the fathers by the prophets, but now he has spoken, main verb, in one who is by his character and nature a son because the word son there does not have the article in front of it, nor does it have any kind of, of word in front of it identifying. It just reads literally in Greek, in son. It doesn't say in the son. It doesn't say in his son. Now, it is the son and it is his son, but in Greek, it's anarthros. There's no article there, and the purpose of that is to express quality and characteristic. And so to paraphrase it a bit, to explain the meaning, what the author of Hebrews is saying is God has spoken his final word to us in one who is, by his character and nature, so different and so superior to the prophets that he is in relationship to the Father as his Son. That's the power of what's being communicated here. God has spoken his final word in one who is his Son. Then, the author of Hebrews tells us seven things about this Son. There are seven participial clauses and relative clauses that describe this son, who he is, and what he has done. I call these the seven wonders of Jesus. Do you remember when you study ancient history? You study the seven wonders of the ancient world, right? You've got uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, sculpture of Zeus there at Olympus, and you've got the hanging gardens of Babylon, and you've got the lighthouse of Halicarnassus, and you've got the Colossus of Rhodes, and you've got all seven. You remember seven wonders of the ancient world. Well, I call each of these statements, which we're about to look at briefly, the seven wonders of Jesus. And you take all the seven wonders of the ancient world, as wonderful as they were, put them all together, and they're nothing but belly button lint compared to the wonders of Jesus. Look at what he says here. First of all, God has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Jesus is God's heir of all things. Now, what is an heir? An heir is someone who is going to receive an inheritance. 
right? If you are an heir, then that means you're in line to receive an inheritance. Well, now God declares that Jesus is God's heir. He is going to receive all things as heir. All things. All things in the physical universe. All things in the spiritual universe. Everything there is at the end of time, God has designed. It's all coming into the lap of Jesus. He is the heir of all things because he is the son. It's common, right? If you have a father who has an only son, then he passes down to his son as his heir, his everything that he has. Well, the father, God the father says that the son, God the son is the heir of all things. Think about that. Everything there is in the physical universe and the spiritual universe by virtue of the fact that he is the son, he's the heir of all things. And oh, don't forget what Paul said in Romans 8. You are joint heirs with Christ. Do you know what that means? Everything God is giving to Jesus, Jesus is sharing with you. In all eternity, joint heirs with Christ. How amazing is that? He is the heir of all things. Number two, look at what else he says. And he's the one who created all things. He's the one who made the universe. Jesus is God's agent of creation. Long before there was a creation, Jesus was there. Long before God stepped out, from behind the curtain of nowhere onto the platform of nothingness and spoke a universe into existence, Jesus was there. And not only that, but when that universe was created, we learn here and other places in Scripture that Jesus is God's agent of creation. And we also learn in the Old Testament in that first chapter of Genesis that the Spirit of God is also involved in creation. Creation is a Trinitarian event according to Genesis 1. And so here is Jesus the Son and God has created the universe through Him. That is the author of Hebrews way of saying that Jesus is the uncreated Creator. He is the uncreated Creator. You see, if Jesus existed before anything else was created, then He Himself by definition has to be uncreated. And therefore, the only thing that is uncreated that doesn't come into existence by virtue of creation, by virtue of some cause, that would be God himself. And this is one of the ways the author of Hebrews is establishing the deity of the Son. Because he, like God, is the creator of all things. Everything there is in the universe created by the Son. The agency of Jesus in creation God the Father, God's agent of creation is God the Son. But then we learn something else about Jesus. Verse 3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory. The word radiance there means outshining. It's a word that means the effulgence of God's glory. Like the sun shines on the earth, the effulgence, the outshining of the sun, and it shines upon all of the earth. So Jesus, we are told, is the expression and the radiance of God's glory. The word glory, beautiful word in the Hebrew Old Testament, kavod, Beautiful word in the Greek New Testament as well. The glory of God is his manifestation of his attributes. God reveals his attributes, and when he does, that is his glory. And as essential to, to uh, Christ is the glory of God, as essential is light to the Son. The Son is light. Jesus is the glory of God. He doesn't just reflect the glory of God. He is God and therefore is the glory of God. And, and in this statement, by the way, and in John chapter 1 and many other places, we discover that 
when Jesus reveals, manifests God, reveals God, He doesn't do that. He doesn't reveal something other than Himself, nor does He reveal something other than God. Jesus is the perfect revelation of God, such that He could say to the disciples and to others, hey, if you have seen Me, you've seen whom? The Father. The Father. So he is the radiance, the outshining of God's glory. Look at number four, this fourth wonder of Jesus. He's the exact expression of God's nature. Look at that. Everything God is, Jesus is, with the exception of the addition of human flesh in the incarnation. Jesus is fully God and perfectly God. An image is made after the likeness of a person, but does not partake of the nature of a person in human existence. Have you ever been to a wax museum? I bet you have at some point. When you go to a wax museum, there are wax figures, and wax figures look amazingly alike the, like the real thing, but they're not the real thing. We have a wax museum over in Dallas and Arlington, mid-cities between Dallas and Fort Worth, Arlington, Texas, and there's a wax museum there. The last time I was there, it's been a few years ago, but there was uh, there Clint Eastwood. I mean, it looked just like Clint Eastwood. You would have thought that if you walked over and touched him, he would speak. It looked just exactly like Clint Eastwood. You could just almost hear him say, a man's got to know his limitations. You can just hear him say, you know, there are two kinds of people, my friend, those with loaded guns and those who dig, you dig. <laughs> now, if you're thinking, what is he talking about? Realize that there are two groups of people on the planet. There are people who know and love Western movies. And then there are the uncultured and ignorant people <laughs> in the world. And so if you're, if you're struggling with those analogies, those words from old Clint, then you can cl classify yourself. And if you need to, broaden your education a little bit there, okay? But there's old Clint. But guess what? It's not Clint. It looks like him, but it is not he. And the reason it's not is because it's a likeness, but it's not made of the same stuff the real Clint is made of. But you see, the author of Hebrews is saying, Jesus is not just an image of God. No, Jesus is the exact representation of the very nature of God because he is made, if you will allow me to use the language of analogy, he is made of the same stuff God is. Jesus is fully God. He is fully divine. Everything God is in terms of nature, so is Jesus. That is orthodox Trinitarian doctrine. And so here we have the author of Hebrews telling us all about the wonder of Jesus. He's the radiance of God's glory. <clears throat> He's the exact representation of God's nature. And then the fifth wonder of Jesus. Look at it. He sustains all things by his powerful word. <clears throat> all things Jesus sustains. Get out your telescope. Go ahead, get it out, get out your telescope and train it on the night sky. And what do you see? Wow, you see our solar system. And there is our solar system. It's kind of a puny solar system as compared with all of the other solar systems and the galaxies. Our galaxy that our solar system's in is really a kind of a puny galaxy. It's called a Milky Way galaxy. I don't know, it has about 100 billion stars in it. And there is our solar system, and there we are, third rock from the sun, and, and really not very much. Did you know if you took a football field, if you were to proportionately reduce our solar system to a football field, the sun would be on the 50-yard line, Earth would be 96 million miles away on the 46-yard line. And Pluto would be on the goal line. Did you know that our Earth is rotating right now at the speed of 1,000 miles per second? That's pretty fast. 
thousand miles per hour actually rotating, moving along pretty fast. Did you know that in our solar system, the earth is rotating around the sun at the speed of 66,000 miles per hour? But that's not even the speed limit in the galaxy because light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. Can you imagine? Who holds all that together? Who sustains all of that? Well, there's one cosmic cop whose badge is deity and who stands and directs galactic traffic with nothing but his powerful word. God sustains the universe by his powerful word. Well, wait a minute. All things. So get out your microscope. Go ahead, get it out. And look in that microscope. And let's take our slide and put in there. And let's get our drop of Kentucky pond water and put on our slide right there. And look at what we see. In that drop of Kentucky pond water are somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000 protozoan. There are 52,000 protozoan in existence that we know of. And let's see who we can find in there. Oh, there's Paramecium. I'd know him anywhere. Kind of shaped like the sole of my shoe there. Oh, there's Euglena. I would know Euglena by that little organelle, that dark spot that she orients toward the sun where she's one of the only protozoan that can actually eat food by waving it with her little cilia into her mouth or she can conduct photosynthesis as she draws near to the sun and create her own food. She's an amazing creature. Oh, there's little rotifer, tiny, tiny little rotifer. I see him over there as well. And in this drop of pond water are thousands of microscopic organisms who holds all that together. Jesus does by his powerful word. From the macrocosm of the universe to the microcosm of a drop of Kentucky pond water, Jesus holds it all together. Now, time out. You get a time out or two in a football game, you ought to get one in a sermon. <laughs> time out. Don't you reckon... That's a Georgia term, which is where I'm from originally. Don't you reckon that if God can hold a universe together, that he can hold your life together? Amen. Do you think he can help you somehow contain and work through the problems of your life? If he can hold a universe together, do you think he might be able to handle your problems? Just a thought. Just a thought. He sustains all things by his powerful word. And then, I come to the sixth wonder of Jesus. He made purification for sin. Now, everything that has been stated about Jesus up to this point is being stated about him in his pre-incarnate life. What he does as God in eternity. But suddenly, the scene shifts. And now we discover what Jesus does when he became one of us. And what did he do? He made purification for sins. This is Old Testament language. Read carefully the Old Testament and all about the sacrificial system and discover that the word purification for sins is the common language that is used to describe what the atonement accomplishes in the Old Testament, symbolizing and picturing the atonement of Christ on the cross. And he would accomplish purification of our sin. Sin, wait a minute, where did that come into the picture? Sin, who brought sin into the universe? How about you up there, all of you planets and stars? Did one of you do that? How about you, Denim, Cassiopeia? What about, what about you? How about you, Aldebaran? 
Which one of you sinned and brought sin into our universe? And I hear them, don't you? With their booming cosmic voices as they say in unison, don't look at us. Well, how about you, little protozoan? 52,000 species of you little protozoan. Which one of you brought sin into this universe? And I hear them in their little microscopic squeaky voice as they call out in unison, don't look at us. Who would dare to bring sin into God's universe? We'll take a look around and take a look at the one preaching today and you will discover who the guilty parties are. We brought sin into the universe and God had every right because of our rebellion against him to leave us in our sinful state determined that we would die and spend eternity paying for our sin in a place called hell. God had every right of doing that but that's not what God did. No, Jesus came, the Son of God. God spoke his final word and Jesus came and died on the cross to make purification for our sins. And can I help you see it as it is written? There is a shift in the actual Greek language of this sixth phrase when it comes. The others are all expressed in the same order of subject, verb, and object. Subject, verb, object. Subject, verb, object. But when you come to this statement, the author reverses everything and almost nobody catches it. And now all of a sudden it is stated in object, subject, and then verb. And it literally reads like this cleansing for sin he himself and he alone has made. That's the author of Hebrews' way of saying to us that of all that Jesus is and everything he is in relationship to God the Father, although contrary to your expectation, contrary to your expectation, Although he is the heir of all things, although he's the creator of all things, although he is in the image of the invisible God, although he is the essence of all God is, although he sustains everything by the word of his power, yet contrary to your expectation for all of that, cleansing for your sin, he himself and he alone has made. That's what the author of Hebrews is trying to convey to you and me this morning. Cleansing for sin. The removal of the sin, the forgiveness, and the cleansing of the guilt is what the atonement of Christ accomplishes when it is applied to every sinner who believes in Christ. And then comes the seventh and final wonder of Jesus. After he did all of these things... <laughs> He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. King of kings and Lord of lords. Because you see, the grave could not hold him. And after he died on the cross and was placed in the tomb, for three days was he in the tomb. But early Sunday morning, that old tomb began to rattle and shake and the angel rolled away the stone and the Lord Jesus rose from the grave and then ascended to heaven and then seated himself at the right hand of God's throne where he sits today awaiting the voice of the Father saying, it's time, son, go get them and bring them home. And one day that will occur. But until then, Jesus reigns now as king. He's on the throne. It may not seem like it. It may seem that drug lords are in charge. It may seem like dictators are in charge. It may seem like evil men are in charge. But no, actually not, not the case. Jesus reigns on the throne and he is in charge. It is his world still. One day he's coming back. He's going to set all the wrongs right and he will reign on David's throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years when he returns and that is our future. The seventh wonder of Jesus is he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 1969, West End Elementary School in Rome, Georgia. It was the last day of the school year. 
It was tradition that on the last day of the school year, the sixth grade class, before they graduated into, in those days, what was called junior high school, the sixth grade class would have a class party on the last day of school. And during that class party, they would elect, the class would elect a Mr. and Miss West End Elementary School. And then their names would be placed on a plaque in the hallway of the school. And so in 1969, end of May, the votes were cast, and it was no surprise to anybody that Terry Littlejohn was elected Miss West End Elementary School. She was drop-dead gorgeous. She was Marsha Brady with brown hair. I mean, she was smart as a whip. And so it came as no surprise to anybody that Terry Littlejohn was elected Miss West End Elementary School. But what came as a big shock was when the votes were tallied, Mr. West End Elementary School turned out to be David Allen. <laughs> and the reason that was a shock was because David Allen was about the shortest boy in the class. And not only that, but he wasn't the most intelligent or sharpest boy in the class. No, that would have been Paul Webb, who as a senior in high school scored a perfect 1600 on the SAT. And it wasn't because I was a sports hunk. No, that honor went to Brad Morrow, who was a Brad Pitt before there was a Brad Pitt. And so it was just a big surprise and shock that David Allen was elected Mr. West End Elementary School. And you see, unlike all the other classes who had their little Kool-Aid cookies in their class on the last day of school, and then their parents came to pick them up, no, 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 that's not how it worked in the sixth grade. The sixth grade class got to board a bus, drive across town to Rock Ridge Roller Rink, where for two hours, the class party was we would skate. We were the only people there, get to skate at the roller rink, have all the Coca-Cola cookies or whatever we wanted. Two hours, it was a blast. And there was a tradition that after a while people were skating, suddenly the lights would go down and people would exit the skating rink floor and the multicolored crystal ball at the top center of the room would begin to turn and the lights were shined on it and it shined down its multicolors on the floor. And the tradition was that Mr. and Miss West End Elementary School would hold hands and skate while everybody else watched. Now, this was a tradition uh, that I knew nothing about, but it was a tradition to which I had no objection. <laughs> and so I got to stand there holding Terry Little John's hand and off we went. And I want you to know in 1969, we did not have any computers. We had no CDs. We had no cell phones. We had no Nintendos, Xboxes, no Segas, no, none of that. No iPods, no iPads. But we had Tommy James and the Shondells. <laughs> well, I don't hardly know her, but I think I could love her. Crimson and Clover over and over. That was a well-known song back in that time. And I got to skate around that rink holding her hand. We got about a lap or two around and suddenly out of my mouth came the coolest words that I have ever spoken to a girl in my entire life. And so we're skating around there and she said, everybody is looking at us. And I said, no, they're not looking at us. They're looking at you. <laughs> you know, it was a wonderful thing to know Terry Littlejohn in school. I knew facts about her. I knew who she was. I knew where she lived. And she lived up on Lions Drive behind the high school. But I'm telling you, it's, a diff it's one thing to know facts about her, but it was a whole nother thing <clears throat> to 
to hold her hand and skate around that rink. It was a whole nother thing, far more wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to know about God, to know facts about him, to know doctrines about him. It's a wonderful thing to know about God. But it is a far more wonderful thing to know that God personally through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I was nine years old, sitting on the fourth row of my church on a Sunday, it's like Jesus stepped into my pew there and reached out his hand and said, David, I want you to come skate through life with me. And from that moment until this, Jesus and I have been skating through life having more fun than anything on the planet because the most wonderful thing in all of the world is not just to know about Jesus, but it is to know him personally and to walk with him every day and to fellowship with him and to hold his hand as you walk through life. And this is the Jesus the author of Hebrews tells us about, that God has spoken his final word, and one who is by his character and nature a son who made purification for your sins. Lord, do anything in me you need to do in order to do everything through me you want to do. Would you bow your heads with me and we pray in just a moment, just a short prayer. We have a time of response before we go to lunch. Is God speaking to you? Could it be one person is here who doesn't know Christ? Is that possible? Could it be there are many of us who are here during this time, beginning of revival, you just want to say, Lord, Thank you for who you are, for what you've done for me. Now, Lord, here is my life dedicated to you. The prayer altar is open right here at the front after I pray. If you want to come and talk to the Lord, go back to your seat. But if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to come. And let me pray with you. I'd be honored to pray with you and lead you to Christ today. Or one of these faculty or students here would love to pray with you. But let's do business with God right now. Whatever the Lord leads us, leads you to do. Father in heaven, have your way right now among us. May we respond as you lead us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? Stand with me and come if you need to. The prayer altar is here. They'll play something right now. While they're playing, you come. Don't wait on others. If you need to come, this is your time right now. Would you do it? Your time. There's time for you.
Lord, do anything in me you need to do in order to do everything through me you want to do so that we may have true revival here this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, as Dr.